Um, so I'm just going to start that. And that is going to go on the city's YouTube page. So that'll be posted and you can share that out with people afterwards if you'd like. Um, and if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat and we'll address them during the Q&A session. Um, and I think, I think that's it for the house for me. So I'll just um, jump in. So this, um, this webinar is part of the Adapt Your Home outreach campaign through Ashland Climate and Energy. So each month is focused on a different topic and this month is Rethink, um, which is, so it's about rethinking your waste habits and um, things like that. So last week we actually had an event about water consumption and that's on the YouTube page. Um, and then next month, as you can see, we have two more events and there's an event in June as well. So you can sign up for those the same way that you signed up for this one. Um, so through the city calendar or on our new website. And all of this is also in support of Ashland's Climate and Energy Action Plan, which you can find more about on our website as well. And the Adapter Home, um, the whole Adapter Home concept is based on the fact that most of Ashland's greenhouse gas emissions come from the residential sector. So we need to take action at home to help um, lower those emissions. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Bex from SAU to get us started. Thanks, Bridget. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Bex Walker, and I'm the Sustainability and Recycling Manager here at Southern Oregon University. I moved to Ashland in 2019, um, at the end of 2019, um, and started in my position here as Sustainability and Recycling Manager. Um, before this, I was in Scotland for 17, 17 years working for the Scottish EPA, um, mainly on climate change policy and waste and resource management um, and implementing EU, UK and Scotland um, regulations in terms of managing um, waste and resources and also greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so for me, waste and materials, resources, they link to everything we do. It's our relationship with the planet, what we're taking from the planet, the services that the planet provides in terms of how we use these materials, in terms of the clean air, the clean water, and our connection to nature, the food we grow to sustain us. And then of course, in terms of how we manage these materials, our relationship with these materials, we then can have adverse environmental impacts, and then of course, as well as climate change. So for me, we do need to rethink our systems, which is why that rethink word is so important here in terms of rethinking waste. We need to think, right, what is our connection along that whole life cycle with materials? We need to rethink about what we're taking, what we're using, what we're making, what we're, how we're disposing of it, and how we're keeping it circulating in the economy. Thinking about the true value of those materials um, and the um, consumption relationship we have with it. Thanks, Bridget. I was about to say next slide. Um, so our consumption patterns are really important here. Our relationship with the materials and resources are important. And of course, that in turn is our relationship with the planet. And then of the way we use them, the way we um, treat them, the way we manage them in our waste systems, that's very important in terms of the impact that these products have. Um, so there's many concepts and principles that we have around this. We have material management, life cycle analysis, circular economy, zero waste. The three R's are quite, um, they've been used a lot longer, reduce, reuse, recycle. Um, all of these, they can be used interchangeably. They all mean something a little bit different. But for me, what they mean is finding a better way of doing things, thinking about the material we're using, why we're using it, and then what impact it would have at the end of its life, and if it really needs an end of life, and if we can actually keep it circulating. At the moment, we very much are tied to a linear economy, the take, make, use, dispose, um, a straight line economy. Whereas a circular economy, looking at how we use materials, um, how we can extend their life, how we can keep them circulating in the economy is far more important here because then we're getting the true value. We're thinking about the impact it will have on society. We're thinking about the impact it has on the environment as well as the economic value of that material. 
Um, and we've set up a lot of systems that they just don't make sense for the community, they don't make sense for the environment, and they don't make sense for the economy on the whole, even though some of them have very much been driven by economic value. But when you really look at the um, impact it's having on the environment and the impact on our communities, they don't make sense. Um, for some examples, take polychlorinated biphenyls. So this is a really useful material. It's an oily substance that we've used. Um, we commercialized it. We're now dealing with a legacy of cleanup. It's heavily regulated. It's having an adverse effect on the environment, but we just saw its use in terms of growing and booming industry. We never actually thought how we should use it. Another one is plastics, much more in the news today. So we have this relationship with plastics where it's convenient. It's an amazing, let's not demonize plastic because at the same time, it's an amazing material. It's sanitized, it's easy to clean, it's useful for so many products. It's in our day-to-day -day life in everything. But we also have systems that aren't managing it probably. We're probably overusing it um, or definitely overusing it. Um, some plastic we use once and then throw away and don't even think about the impact that that has. And now we have a system that, that is on us where we're gonna end up with more plastic in the ocean by weight than fish in 2050. And this is a system we've created. And we have to start sometimes thinking and challenging ourselves, undoing this, like how, how come we have done this? So we go back to the basics. So I was using terms like circular economy, zero waste, material management, life cycle analysis. But if you look at the different um, parts of this in terms of what we're using, how we're using it, why we're using it and what can happen to it. What can we do as individuals? Because sometimes we feel powerless, sometimes it's huge and we're like, well, what can we do? So the most desirable is to reduce and is to reduce our consumption. Um, but I don't want to communicate the environmental agenda as something of a compromise because it often is in terms of less is better, but actually it's just doing things differently so it is better. Um, we don't need to use everything that we do. So reduce is about thinking a little bit differently about when we take something and use it, do we really need to use it? Reuse is the second most desirable. Can we, where we're using things for a single amount of time, can we actually reuse? So the most things we've seen come in through um, either initiatives or programs in different cities or through ordinances is plastic bags, straws, you know, the culprits that we see that we don't necessarily have to use just a single time. And so to carry, you know, that reusable coffee cup, um, reusable takeout, um, reusable water bottle, these are really simple things that we can do that don't necessarily compromise our convenience here either. And they're really, they make economic sense for the value that we keep those materials in the economy environmental sense, and then equity and community sense in terms of the impact that these materials have on our communities. And then recycle, we want to recycle, but it's actually the merely last resort. We shouldn't say, oh, well, I'm recycling it so I feel better. We should have thought much further up what materials we're using and why. Um, and recycling, it simply isn't about separating into the right receptacle. Recycling means we want to see it. Oh, sorry, Bridget, can you go back a slide? Recycling means we want to see it um, in terms of being used again. We want to see it turned into something useful. So we have to think carefully about, and Jamie's going to cover this in her presentation, about what things we do recycle. Not everything is recyclable, which means we then should challenge ourselves, or oh, why are we using it in the first place? Um, so there's a lot to think about there, just in terms of the value of materials and what they mean for the environment, the community, as well as well as the economy. Um, after recycling, the least desirable things in terms of the materials we use are, of course, energy recover recovery from incineration and landfill, because these should be a last resort, because that means that material, that resource is lost from forever from our planet. Um, so typically, as I mentioned, we do live in this linear system and it's about thinking what we can do in our everyday lives to make that system a little bit more circular. Um, and just think about the impact that these materials and products have in what we do. Uh, Bridget, next slide, please. Thank you. So I'm just gonna look at one, two systems. First, the food system. Um, and if we look at this specifically in terms of material and food produce. Um, so it's estimated in the US that between 30 and 
of the food supply is wasted. Now this is during the whole food chain. So this is from um, the growing, the storing, the transportation, the processing, um, once it comes into the grocery stores or the markets, our purchasing of it, and then of course from our own, own home. Within that 30 to 40%, it's quite a sizable chunk that is wasted from our homes. They're, they're estimating it's around about 35 to 40% of the 30 um, of the food that is wasted. So a lot is wasted earlier on in terms of the growing, the storing, the processing, but a significant chunk is our homes. And that's our buying and our cooking habits and us thinking about what we're doing. I often think food comes with a double whammy compared to other materials. Because if food is wasted, it's never actually been used. Um, so why we've actually wasted something that never had a use in the first place. And when you have food security issues going on, this just seems like, where is it in the system that we can actually reduce that wasted food? And again, comes with the consequence of greenhouse gas emissions. Six to 8% of global greenhouse gas emissions is um, account from wasted food. That's a huge chunk. So we have to think rather than jumping in the end of that wasted food, what can we do with it? We also have to think right further up the system. So it's important to where can we reduce it? Where can we look at spoilage in terms of the storing and the processing? Where can we look at our cooking and buying habits? Where can we look at redistributing it to those that need it in terms of either um, um, in terms of animal feed, it can be redistributed or actually it still has use to redistribute it within our communities. And finally, then think about what do we need in terms of treatment and disposal? And when we say treatment, that is a valuable product. That is an organic product that can degrade into putting back into our earth to give value to our soils. The other system, Bridget, can you take me to the next slide, please? Thank you. The other system I wanted to talk about was plastic as a specific material. Um, and I've already alluded to the fact that we've got pretty significant issue in our oceans with um, by 2050, by weight, we're gonna have more plastic than fish. And this is, that's huge. This is, um, this is one of the biggest crises facing us in terms of what we have and what we've done to our oceans here. Only 9% of plastic that's ever been produced has been recycled. And it's one of the easier to recycle um, types, but then you look at our systems and it's not actually that surprising that only 9% has been recycled because you've got multiple types, not all of that recyclable, not all can be recycled or have processes in certain areas. It's usually where you have economies of scale in the larger cities that you can actually recycle more types of plastic because they have that amount that they can make it useful to go to. You then have the fact that you've got a globalized system here as well. So a lot of the reprocessing plants um, and also the processes that need that plastic are in other parts of the world to where it's being produced. So we're shipping plastic to other countries. We have more of a service industry um, in areas in Europe, the UK and the US, and then you have more of a manufacturing industry in places like China and India, a lot to do with labor costs here. And so we're working within that globalized system. Um, and we're seeing the plastic. So we're not only seeing it in the oceans, we're seeing it in the food chains. We're seeing animals die. And when we look at them, we're seeing their stomachs full of plastics. There's some absolute horrific films um, showing the detail of this, where it's coming from um, out there that really show the um, tragedy of this problem. And then we have, and it's confusing because we want to recycle. So we have all these types of plastics and we just want to put them in the recycling bin and hope hope for the best, but actually we need to think carefully, what ones are we using and which ones are recyclable? Um, and then in our systems, they are escaping into our, into our environment. So even with the waste management systems that we have, they're getting blown. It's a light material. It's getting blown, it's getting into rivers and it's getting into oceans that way. So there's lots of different ways that it is actually getting into the oceans here. And single use plastic is one of the biggest culprits and it's our relationship with it. And I mentioned it before, and we really have to say, does that single use make economic sense? Does it make environmental sense? Do we want to be part of a community that just uses a valuable material? That's something that the earth gives us for a few seconds saying, oh, well, that was useful. Um, so we do need to think about, you know, look at what we purchase, go in the supermarket, start purchasing the least packaged stuff, because 
money talks, influence talks, consumer talks. If every consumer is opting for the least packaged um, product or material, then companies will start changing their packaging because all of a sudden they're like, oh, well, mine's not being bought. Why isn't it not being bought? And this influences a behavior change much further up in terms of the businesses. So I just touched on plastics and food, just as two systems that I think about of how we can intervene and make a difference um, as individuals, but also just challenge the systems that we've created. Um, I'm now gonna talk a little bit more about um, what we've done at SOU um, around material and waste management. Um, could you take, thanks Bridget. Um, so we have a program of work across the whole life cycle. Um, we look at our sustainable purchasing and we have just recently reviewed our sustainable purchasing policy, which is really about thinking about what we're bringing onto campus is can it be can it be um, reused? Can it be um, do we need it in the first place? Can it be recycled locally? And then also the impact that purchase might have. Like, is it in terms of equity? Is it helping local businesses? Is it driving innovation? Is it something that is going to have a positive impact on the environment and not and reduce greenhouse gas emissions? And we've brought a couple of things in. So in terms of a checklist for all purchases over $25,000, we want to see them being used for purchases for campus and for under 25,000 to use that checklist as a guide. And then also to have specific um, a requirement for any services that we contract, we will now assess the criteria that come in on the company's sustainability and environmental policy as well. Again, this is the influence in terms of our purchasing, money talks, and so if we're asking companies that are providing a service for us, you know, what's your, what's your thoughts about the environment? What's your sustainability policy? All of a sudden behavior starts changing across the board. And um, we're reducing single use on campus. We're looking at our food and dining and then promotion of reuse as well. And we have a number of reuse initiatives. We also recycle um, quite a lot on campus with smaller, um, more bespoke things from marker pens um, through to electrical goods. And then we have, a we're very lucky to have a recycling center on campus where we have commingled and cardboard um, sorted um, and glass sorted as well. And we're just in the process of expanding this recycling center as a project that students are involved in, which is really exciting because they've been able to look at the design, how can we, um, be more efficient in what we're segregating on campus and um, and so that's a useful project in terms of a learning environment for them researching what works how can we get better value for materials on campus and we've also done some work around our food system so again we went right for the top we um, instead of just looking at the end end treatment we've looked at how we can reduce the food waste first so we looked at our plate sizes we've looked at what food we're um, preparing and we've also signed up to the Real Food Challenge and we've also lucky as well as a recycling center on campus we have a farm that produces food so we're looking at closing the loop so the food produced by the farm is what is used in our dining hall in, um, in terms of the meals that are provided. We did take pre-consumer food waste um, to a farm locally so it was redistributed as animal feed for pigs um, we are unable to do that because that farm's currently not taking. So if anyone knows of a farm that is interested in pre-consumer food waste, please contact me because I would be really happy to hear from you. And then once we've done everything to reduce our food waste, we'll start, um, we did had started looking pre-pandemic and we will continue to look at what we can do with the amount we have left in terms of post-consumer food waste and to explore this. Um, so that's a few of the things that we're doing on campus. I'm always open to other ideas, to working with the community um, on materials and waste management on campus. But the main thing for us is we recognize we're a community here at SOU that has, has an impact in what we're doing. And we can pilot things, we can showcase things, we can test things to see if they work and work with students on different projects here. Um, and so I'm taking questions at the end of all presentations and happy to answer any questions, but I will for now hand you over to Jamie from Recology. Thank you. Just kidding. <laughs> 
just want to do the thing where I had to talk and you guys all thought I was on mute. No. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Jamie Rosenthal. I, uh, I've lived here in Ashland since uh, 97 when I moved here for college. I'm a waste zero specialist for recology. I um, am also like, you know, um, on the cons or climate and cons climate outreach and conservation commission. I am a member of the Oregon Refuse and Recycling Association, a master recycler. And um, if you look here at this slide, I might know who's inside the middle of that uh, recycling cart costume too. Um, next to me is uh, a driver named Terry. He's actually somewhat responsible for me actually getting into this uh, work that I'm in. I uh, was what we call a wishful recycler. Um, we'll go into that a little more later, but um, back when Ashland first got recycling roll carts, I was uh, putting salad containers in my recycling because they had the recycle symbol on them and they must be recyclable. And I was a very enthusiastic, wishful recycler. So um, one day, Terry, you know, friendly Terry, big smile on his face, uh, you know, lets me know you can't put those in the cart. And after he left, I thought, oh, he's just a garbage man. He doesn't know what he's talking about, whatever. You know, it has the recycle symbol on it. And um, you know, fast forward to uh, today, you know, well, we won't fast forward yet to today. I actually ended up running into a friend who was a master recycler and she actually educated me that about the recycle symbol and um, what wishful recycling is. And so then I made it my mission to do it the best that I could and ended up at Recology. So next slide, please. Uh, some of you may not know, uh, waste collection got its roots and recology got its roots in collection from immigrants uh, who had come over uh, to the United States and they were persecuted, they weren't given jobs, they were considered low life. And the way that they survived was by going around and finding things that people had discarded and they would find things of value like metal and they would resell those items to make a living for themselves. Uh, that eventually those people organized and to keep disease down, to, to keep our streets clean. Uh, they eventually became the Sunset Scavengers and uh, became what we know today as Recology. So we have some really humble roots in that area. And if you see down in the lower left there, that's exactly how they used to collect the garbage, you know, horse-drawn carriages with you know, big, huge sacks on their backs. And um, it was a much needed service at the time. Next slide, please. Um, oh, um, one other thing I wanted to mention about Recology is we are 100% um, employee owned, which is to um, most of us. And, you know, when you have people who are actually owners of the company, it's, it's personal if um, someone's upset with the service. So we're all very invested in making sure that we're providing the best service possible because if you own your own business, you obviously want <laughs> things, your customers to be happy. So um, we operate the Ashland Recycling Center on Water Street and we operate the Valley View Transfer Station on Valley View Road, which will be the site uh, this weekend actually of an event called the Green Debris drop-off day. Um, that's an opportunity for residents of Ashland to bring green debris for free um, with the purpose being that we have less debris around our houses to burn in case of fire. So that event is running from 8.30 to 3.30 this Saturday. I encourage you all to participate or 
if you can't participate, maybe you can let a couple people know about it and they can. Next slide, please. So I want um, people to think about, you know, who do you want to be? Do you want to be a, a conscious recycler or a wishful recycler? A wishful recycler is someone who, like I was, thinks, um, you know, look at my, I don't know why roller skate is coming to mind, but it is. And, you know, you think, oh, this is kind of an exaggeration, but oh, someone else in the world can use this. I'm going to put this in my recycle cart because down the line, the fairies of recycling will make sure that it gets to the proper person. <laughs> A conscious recycler is someone who, before they put something in, they're well versed with the list. And um, Bridget, can you go to the next slide, please? So here we have uh, a list of what goes into the recycling cart. Um, I often, you know, people will look at this list and they'll say to me, well, what about this item? well, what about this item? And what I try to remind people is that if you look at the list and you, you know, I say, do you see that particular item on the list? They'll say, well, no, I don't. Then the answer is it, it doesn't go in. Um, so this list we've, um, I'll just go over some of um, the details of it. Uh, we've got mixed paper and cardboard metal, aluminum, and tin. And I would say the um, questions we get most about are about plastics. And what we know about plastics is that plastics with the numbers one, two, and five in that little recycle symbol, uh, those are the types of plastics that are wanted out in the world to make new products. Generally speaking, the rest of the numbers are, I'm gonna use this pretty loosely, junk plastic. It's very low value. Manufacturers generally don't want it because it's not gonna be enough um, for the purpose. It's not gonna have the quality that uh, numbers one, two, and five have. Now, I often get questions about, well, why can't we just all go by the numbers? And here's a small example of why. Uh, you can see there's a, a tub of uh, butter there in the picture under the what goes in a recycling cart picture. And now the tub itself would potentially be a five, let's say. And the lid, could be a totally, it, it often is a different number, uh, not a one, two, or five. And if it was indeed a one, two, or five, the nature of the item itself, meaning it's flat. Uh, if I have a lid thrown into the recycling along with a bunch of sheets of you know, paper, that lid or cardboard that lid is potentially going to get trapped in between the fibers of the cardboard or paper. When the paper goes off to the paper section, <laughs> using that loosely as well, uh, we have a potential for that plastic to contaminate the paper stream. So we don't want to go by the numbers because the equipment at facilities is designed to operate the way that it operates and items like lids will cause problems. And another example would be items that are too small. Um, if, it's, it's, if it's smaller, much smaller than your fist, it's probably going to somehow either be so light that it blows off of the line or it will um, fall through the cracks of the sorting equipment somehow. Uh, next slide, please. Actually, can you go back to that one? I'm sorry, Bridget. <clears throat> uh, one thing I wanted to let you know, it says in the plastic section, bottles, jugs, and tubs. Uh, we define a bottle as anything, uh, a material that 
uh, has a neck smaller than the base. So um, that could be a lotion bottle, a shampoo bottle, a detergent bottle. Um, gosh, there's others too. But um, you know, just when you see bottles, just think of neck smaller than the base and it can go in there. Next slide. Uh, where does it go? So um, no, uh, your plastic is not going directly into the ocean, into a sea turtle's mouth. It is um, going somewhere reputable and responsible. Uh, we get a lot of questions about that, obviously, because there are companies out in the world collecting these materials and doing um, unethical things with them. Uh, in the lower left-hand picture, um, well, first of all, our material goes to a recology facility in Northern California. It's in Samoa. And that facility um, then ships uh, materials both domestically and internationally to reputable facilities. How do I know that these facilities are reputable? Um, we go, we literally go and check them out. And so in that lower left-hand picture, that's a picture taken um, right before COVID hit um, our area and we weren't allowed to be in person with each other anymore. We took a trip to Samoa with the Jackson County Master Recyclers. And um, the man on the very far left uh, in the white shirt, his name is Bo. And when we are looking to market our material to international markets, we send him out and he speaks multiple languages and he goes to the facilities, he checks what they're doing there and he makes sure everything is on the up and up so that we know that the proper things are happening with our material. Um, what you're seeing in these other pictures uh, on the far left, that's um, just basically a truck that has a load that's dumping all that recycling down. And then that recycling will get loaded onto conveyor belt and go through the whole maze of a process. <laughs> Um, it's a lot like Mousetrap. In fact, I think it's exactly the same model as Mousetrap, that game. So um, high level engineering going on. On the right hand side, uh, there is a picture of bales of recycling. So after it's all sorted and gone through, uh, it is packed very tightly. It weighs a million pounds, not literally. And um, then it gets shipped off in a big cargo ship um, off to where it needs to go. Um, I saw a quick, and if it, others have questions, um, I'm gonna wait until the end to ask those questions so, so I won't forget. Um, the lower right picture that you see, that um, there's these, uh, yeah. The technical term I think is spinny things. I can't remember what the term is, but um, that picture shows you what can happen if you put some contamination, like let's say a plastic bag, like a, a grocery plastic bag. Um, those little gears are spinning so fast that, and plastic bags are so light that they can get caught in those gears. When that happens, the other gears heat up that plastic, it becomes a gooey mess. Um, we eventually have to shut down the entire line because the buildup is so bad. And then that plastic has to be cut out. Um, it does come at a risk, uh, not only in that if a, a operation isn't running, there's no money being made during that time because you're, you're not doing your job. And then there's an occupational uh, hazard of, you know, hurting yourself trying to, you know, they're very careful, but it's, you know, climbing up there, you don't really want to spend a whole lot of time up there. So next slide. Okay. And also just give you a few more minutes warning, Jamie. So recess okay. to talk. I'll go, I'll go through fast. Okay. Um, we have green debris service here in Ashland and that service is just for anything that grows in your yard. Um, and what's really neat about it is that material goes to rogue disposal, uh, rogue, otherwise, well, it's a sub subsidiary of rogue disposal called rogue compost and gets turned into compost that we can use locally. A lot of people will love buying it because it's, it's literally 
you know, this compost from our area. Next slide. Um, so I'm gonna go over, there's a few common um, issues we find often in recycling. This one's a really tough one for people because the recycling symbol, it is not trademark, which means that anyone, any manufacturer can slap the recycling symbol on pretty much anything and say, please recycle, giving you the consumer the idea that it's put it, fine to put it in your cart. So this is an Amazon envelope. I may have altered it a little bit by making it a somewhat frowny face. Um, and right on the bag, it says paper bag. But if you tear that open, there's a foamy material in there. And the foamy material is not recyclable. So this is something that if you receive it, don't put it in your recycling. Um, it's trash, unfortunately. And I have verified this with our material recovery facility in Northern California. Next slide. Egg cartons are unfortunately something that would be a better use for composting in your backyard or starting a fire. Um, this material's reached its what we call end of life. The fibers are so uh, negated that you really can't turn those fibers into much else. So if we were to recycle it, what would we turn it into? There's not many options that I can think of. The other thing is a, that's a common one is shred. Shred, um, not only when it gets to facilities uh, to be sorted, it's, um, you have to wear a mask because it creates so much dust, but it's so light that it flies all over the place. And it is just, it's not even gonna get to the end of the sorting line. Not even if you put it in a paper bag, I get a lot of questions about that. That bag is gonna get broken open. Um, so it's, it's not, okay, next slide. Just in case you got a little stressed out with all that stuff you can't do, um, I just wanted to remind you to stay calm and look at this dog, she's mine. I, adopt, I actually re reused her, she was somebody else's dog. You can even reuse a dog. Right here is a perfect example. Next slide. Um, compostable products are something that are a huge problem in recycling. People often think that they can put this either in their compost and anyone who's put that in your home, home compost will tell you that it's not breaking down. And if you put it in your recycle cart, because it mimics real plastic, it will mix with the real plastic compromising that material. So that joke just kind of will remind you, don't just buy it because it has a label on it. Really do your research first. Next slide. Is there another slide that you really want to touch on so I can make sure? Oh, time? Um, yeah. Okay. So <laughs> you can skip past that one. Uh, these are um, other opportunities to rethink waste. Uh, we've got a Zoom workshop coming up May, I believe it says May 17th. It's kind of small on my screen. May 18th, May 18th. Um, I'm gonna do a Zoom workshop. Uh, we have a program where if you're, a business owner and want to see if you can be certified, Waste Zero certified, uh, contact us and we'll come out and do an evaluation for you. Next slide. Uh, I can talk about metal at the end, but small pieces of metal like what you're seeing on the right hand side here can be taken to our recycle center and collected for free. They can also be collected at the transfer station for free. And um, th the reason you can't put it in the recycling is because those pieces are so small. Next slide. These are just some ways you can reuse. Um, just, these are my personal examples. I make my own soap and reuse the container, slap the picture on there. Um, I made a vase out of a, I don't know, a jar that I had and a hanger. This was a gift from someone I didn't really want it. So I turned it into a place to hang my earrings. 
Um, these are all ways that we can, can rethink waste. Okay, cool. I'm gonna pass it over to Risa. Oh, great, thanks. Okay. Um, Risa, go ahead. So yeah, so I should probably try to do this in five minutes so that we have 10 minutes for uh, answering questions, Bridget. Okay. I, I, I just, I, anyway, okay. So really quickly, I um, am going to share with y'all um, two initiatives um, that happened in Ashland as pilots um, that I think nicely reflect the idea of rethinking waste, avoiding waste, trying to come up with uh, solution, simple solutions to uh, the challenge of diverting resources um, in the first place. So the, the Cannon Bottle Initiative, it came through the commission in about 2008. And the way that we came up with the idea was really over the course of time, looking at what other cities have done and then coming up with something that made sense for our community because what works here or somewhere else is not necessarily replicable. So this was just an idea to be incredibly convenient for people when they're those people that are consuming uh, containers that uh, it was a nickel deposit, now it's a dime deposit. So the value is higher it goes in the container and then the people that, that can utilize those deposits can take them. So they're doing a community service for us. Um, and that said, currently, you know, we don't have an easy way to redeem our uh, bottles and cans, but I hope you'll hang on to them and not trash them and not put them in your recycling because your dime is lost and there's plenty of people that could really benefit from that dime. So moving on to the next slide, thank you, uh, is another example of uh, a, an initiative that began as a pilot that was about 10 years in the making, you know, researching how other communities um, came up with programs to eliminate the use for single use containers. And so we launched the pilot of Road to Go last year, January, 2020. And uh, we started with five Ashland um, eateries uh, through a grant that we got from the Department of Environmental Quality. And uh, we worked out enough of the kinks to be able to then expand the program. Now we're at nine plus participants. There are two in Medford and um, one in Phoenix and seven in Ashland. And I just, if, if you're unfamiliar with it and you may say to yourself, what, are you kidding me? All this talk about plastic and how horrible it is, which I couldn't agree more. It actually, in our research and in our extensive um, work with the uh, local restaurants, this is the best choice given what we have. Um, and the reason it's the best choice is that it's hinged, like similar to the evil uh, plastic clamshells that are used once and then belong in the trash. Um, but these are good hundreds, thousands of times. And uh, what, what Bex was talking about, this is not a, a linear solution. It's a circular solution because when this container is tired, broken, done, Road to Go will collect these containers and we have an agreement with the people that make the containers and they will take them back, shred it, and use it to make a new container. So, and then there's also little round 
classic ones that are less popular, but the people that like them really like them. Um, you can go to roguetogo.com and you can get more information about the program. Um, if you're an Instagrammer, you can also go to at rogue to go and uh, this is um, Javier Cruz. He's one of our local um, participants with rogue to go um, in the interest of time, because I could really talk about this and other things a lot longer, but I, it is important that you all get uh, some of your uh, questions answered. So miraculously, I'm, I'm gonna stop and thank you for your interest and participation with our efforts today. Awesome. So thank you everyone for sharing. That was so great, good information. Um, I'm just gonna, there's a lot of questions in the chat. So I'm just gonna um, start at the top, but um, we have one from Natalie that says, are there textile, clothing, recycling, and recirculation efforts at SOU? So I think that's geared towards Bex. Um, at the moment, we have, there were some student initiatives um, before the pandemic. Um, this is one material stream I would love to look at more closely in terms of what we can do for reuse and then also for end of life recycling. I know it's up there with food in terms of one of the problem waste streams in terms of um, greenhouse gas emissions. So I would welcome a conversation on this. Um, yes, definitely. <laughs> I can put my contact email in the chat for you, Natalie. Awesome. Um, and questions and questions for Jamie. Um, is the drop off? Can you clarify the date of the drop off day or maybe put that link in the chat? Um, yeah. And also, does it cover used and rotting lumber? So it's your standard uh, green debris. No, it would not consider lumber would not be um, accepted. It's just things that grow in your yard, uh, flammable things like that. Lumber is accepted there, wouldn't be accepted on that day though, because we're not open on that day typically. Um, the events is Saturday uh, from 8.30 to 3.30. Oh, I'm sorry. It is not this Saturday. It's this Sunday from 8.30 to 3.30 when we're closed out there. Got it. And I might be able to put the link in here if I don't get another question. Uh, yeah, um, a few more. Um, I think you already mentioned this, but metal lids, you said you could take to the recycling center and mm -hmm. just, and do plastics have to be rinsed out? Yes, they do. They need to be rinsed out and dry. And um, also the clamshell containers, or they, they go in the trash. Reese is shaking her head no. So <laughs> yes, the trash are not okay a lot of times even though believe it or not there are 40,000 different types of plastics so just because you see numbers one through seven it's like so even though the clamshell may have a number one on it we know that that material is is basically junk plastic a lot of times it's so thin that it will just compress and then it becomes just like a lid what I explained with the issue with lids so keep those out of your your recycling um, does Rogue, Linda asked, does Rogue Shed recycle their material? Their shred, yes. Oh, shred, I, I they were that wrong. Shred. So Rogue Shred is different than Rogue Disposal. Rogue Shred, that paper is such high quality office paper that they do recycle it. They sell it and it becomes new material. Got it. Um, I have another question from Natalie, if you, do you know when the next master recyclers program is coming up? Um, I am not sure, but I would check the Jackson County master recycler, maybe do a keyword search. They have a website, so there would be an announcement there. Um, we also have a question from Barbara. Is the plastic used for the help and greenhouses reused? I'm not totally sure what's, maybe if you could unmute yourself and um, if you feel comfortable asking that question. But if not, that's okay too. <laughs> oh, hemp plastic. Um, if that can be reused. I, uh, 
meaning recycled or like you can reuse any pretty much anything so i don't i don't know uh, you can't put it in your recycling if that's what you're asking okay um i think i got all of the questions in the chat does anyone have any other questions or if i missed your question i'm sorry um but feel free to unmute and ask any one of them question about bark mulch oh Oh, sorry, can bark mulch be recycled as green debris to create compost? We don't take bark mulch. Or we've got a lot of problems with that. A lot of times it's mixed with other materials like dirt and it's treated and it's so, no, we don't take bark mulch. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, any other questions? Yeah, Risa. Well, if everyone's done talking, I just would like to just put out that the Conservation and Climate Outreach Commission would be delighted to uh, receive applications. We have two empty seats. And um, so if, if, you are, if you have ever been curious or would like to participate, um, please consider contacting the city recorder, Melissa Hutala. Uh, I think you can get an application online. It, there's a whole process, but I just thought I'd put in a plug. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and after this, I think I mentioned in the beginning of the presentation, but I'll send a follow-up email with um, resources and any of the links um, that might be helpful. Um, I wanted to address, there was a comment from someone thank you for this comment because what she says is actually true amazon uh that foamy stuff i was talking about earlier amazon does claim that that is recyclable and that's specifically what i spoke to our material recovery facility operators about and they are indicating and this is a state of an art facility it's one of the best facilities in the country they're indicating that this type of foamy stuff is not good for the recycling stream. So Amazon is saying it is recyclable. They're slapping the symbol on there. And unfortunately, even though the article exists, it's, it's not. To add to what Jamie's saying, this comes down to an infrastructure question as well. And often the claims about recyclable it might be recycled one place in the world, or possibly there's a technology to recycle it somewhere in the world. And right away, that claim that it's recyclable can be made. But we have to, again, look at the whole life cycle. What are we bringing into our community? What does our infrastructure look like in terms of the economies of scale that we have here in Southern Oregon? What, what is it going to look like in the long term? Where should we be investing in future infrastructure? So again, yeah, it goes back to what Jamie was saying, that claim around recyclable. Um, is yeah something we need to we need to work with and not like just focus on that word we need to look at the whole system we need to change our systems and not just think it's about recycling it's actually about what materials we're using in the first place and why so um i can address a couple of these new questions coming in. And I think we have a couple minutes left. Um, so first of all, yes, very frustrating about the Amazon thing. It could be also that the concentration is so great of the foamy stuff, you know, even though it may be similar to glue and cardboard, now this foam is like everywhere. So we don't want like tons and tons of glue on cardboard in the recycling stream. So that could be an issue of why it's a problem. Um, and yes, it is frustrating. Um, yes, there is a free box center at the uh, free box. That's a clothing acceptance um, exchange. No money is exchanged there. You can drop your clothing off. Um, it's not open right now due to COVID. So when it is up and running again, we will be making an announcement about that. Um, so stay tuned either on our Facebook page or website for that. Um, the other thing, 
Is Recology looking into composting facilities? Yes, we are working with local government and we are working with other organizations to try to figure out what is the best situation for our somewhat rural area. Um, we do offer pickup for composting as far as your green debris and you can put uh, what we call pre-consumer composting in, in your green debris cart. That's things like vegetable peelings, apple cores, um, you know, anything that hasn't been cooked. So if those carrots have been cooked, they can't go in there. A lot of people don't know that. It's perfectly fine to put that in your green debris bin. And that only is like under $10 a month to have that service. So that may help people as well. And there, yes, there is a facility called Rogue Compost that does have a pickup service. Um, they exist as well. Yeah, Risa. Oh, there was a question in the chat, um, uh, a link to uh, City of Ashland to apply for the uh, a commission position. Might you have that? Or maybe if I could get that person's email, then I could forward it to someone um, at the city because I'm just a middle person, but I'm happy to um, help in any way I can. And yeah. no, I don't have that information at I my just to find it If it's through the city. Sorry? If it's through the city, I could probably find it. Um, but thank you. <laughs> oh, and, and if, if you have an issue or you are, um, you know, for me, I wouldn't be able to find it. I'd get lost. But if, if, if you need help, maybe reach out to Bridget and, and then she can pass it to me and blah, blah, and we'll make it happen. I'm, I'm on that commission. I'm absolutely happy to help. Um, so you can, we can put it in the email about the textiles as well. I'll email you. Thank you. Thanks. Awesome. And Jamie's added the link. <laughs> uh, well, I added the link for the uh, green debris collection event this weekend. Oh, okay. I haven't found that one yet. Well, it's two o'clock, so I just want to be aware of everyone's time. If you need to log off, that's totally fine. Um, there's two more questions we didn't have answered yet. Um, so I maybe if you want to contact. I'm going to send in the, in the email, have everyone's contact information so you can follow up with each person individually if you have a topic specific question. Um, so yeah, I just thank you everyone for spending this time with us on Zoom. I know it's a nice day outside. Um, so thank you for that. And thank you to Bex and Jamie and Risa for this great presentation and great information. Thank you everyone. Thank you all. Thanks, Bridget. Thank yes, thanks, Bridget. Thank you. And Jamie. <laughs> and Bex. We're all leaving. <laughs>